Good morning on this beautiful, crisp fall day. Wonderful to have you here in worship together and want to welcome you folks and welcome our folks that are worshiping um, in their automobiles on the FM station. Welcome. And also those who will be worshiping with us online. Glad that you are all with us. Have, um, I do want to thank you, thank all of you for showing that you care for others uh, by wearing your mask and practicing social distancing and sanitizing hands whenever we are together. It shows that you care for the others around you. And I just want you to know how much that is appreciated. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It allows us to be together um, to praise God. We have a prayer service for the election that will be uh, taking place October 25th. Uh, Pastor Dondina has put together an inspiring worship service for us. Uh, it will be just a service of prayer and uh, for the election. On October 25th, we will worship out here in the morning. And then at 2 p.m., you have an opportunity to worship in the sanctuary. So invite you to join us at 2 p.m. on the 25th. Uh, Pastor Dondina has also put together a seven-day prayer guide from uh, this time of our service for the seven days leading up to the election day. So please join us, uh, plan on joining us for that special uh, service. Next Sunday, we will have our uh, Children's Sunday, and our Next Generation director is leading that, Peggy Nunley. She will also bring our message for us that day with the help of the children throughout the worship service. She is in the process of becoming licensed as a local pastor. So I'm excited to give her this opportunity to share a message with you. Let us now be inspired by our music for gathering.
Pastor Dondina, can you come over here, please? Before we stand together to worship and greet each other, we wanted to let the pastors know that we've been collecting in your honor for the non-food pantry. And we have cleaning supplies for you, so that's how we're trying to thank you and remember you. And then just as a little token here, we have flowers. We're, we're so blessed, and now I'm speaking for everyone, to have both of you here as our pastors. You can't know how much we love you and appreciate you. We hope we show it, but on this special day, we wanted to be sure that you knew we were always thinking of you, but wanted to have a special time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Join me, join me now in our call to worship this morning, please. Who is my neighbor? The righteous and the unrighteous, the just and the wicked. Who else is my neighbor? The rich and the poor, the weak and the strong. Is anyone else my neighbor? The great and the small, the arrogant and the humble. They are no different than I am. You must love your neighbor as yourself. You may be seated. Thank you all for your faithful giving to the ministries of this congregation. When you give, you partner with God in accomplishing God's good purposes in our world. So let us pray. We don't give because you make us. God. We don't, we don't give because anyone else is watching. We give because we are grateful and because we want to be part of the work of your kingdom in every way we can. Jesus reminds us in the temple that the way our money helps or hurts others matters to you. And so we ask that this money would help your reign to flourish. Amen. As always, um, your bulletin lists those persons that we need to remember throughout the week uh, in our prayer. I especially want to lift up Jackie Todd to you this morning. 
She will have a heart cath on Tuesday morning, very early, and uh, potentially in the same week, um, heart surgery. So um, we want to remember Jackie, um, her family, uh, during this week especially. Let us pray. Almighty God of action, you do not sit still, but you are always at work for our good. You are constantly on the move, traveling with us as we journey through unknown territory, never resting and never sleeping. You are ever and always building and creating, restoring and renewing, rescuing and redeeming. You are not a philosophy or a principle. You are not a divine concept or simply a good story, unmoved and unmoving. You are a God of action, not just in the ancient biblical past, but every day and today. Without your hand at work in our world, we could not survive. By your active will, we carry on. And so today, we praise you, O oh God of mighty acts, how great you are. And yet you call us to yourself in the silence, in moments of inactivity, when we have stopped our frantic running and at last begun to listen. Be still and know that I am God. You said that. But it is so hard. We can barely sit still, let alone be still. O oh, great God of action and silence, help us learn how to be still so that we can really know you, so that we can really experience your presence in our lives. Help us learn to be people of stillness in the midst of our activity so that we can more readily discern what work you are doing in our midst, because that is the work that we want to do too how great you are in your stillness. These have been such difficult months, O oh God, economic, health, and family issues related to the coronavirus remain huge stressors on our lives. We despair over the incivility that plagues our nation and the intransigence of our politics. Even as our own country fights to recover from devastating hurricanes in the Gulf region, even as forest fires still rage in California and throughout the West, the people of Lebanon try to cope with the massive economic collapse because of a failed government. And it is not just Lebanon, O oh God, but many nations in our world are at the point of collapse. Individuals, too, God, need your care. We remember those in our congregation, Jackie and Harriet, Carol and Jane, who face their own personal struggles with illness. And there are more than just a few of us wrestling with situations and issues that weigh us down and keep us awake at night. We call on you, O oh God of action, do your work. We call on you. O oh God of silence, be our peace. When we doubt your goodness, reveal yourself to us in the stillness. When we are troubled about the future, reveal yourself to us in the stillness. When we fear today, reveal yourself to us in the stillness. Remind us daily of Jesus' words. In this world you will have trouble, but do not be afraid for I have overcome the world. May we know you, O oh God of peace. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson is from Leviticus 
chapter 9, verses 1 through 2 and 15 through 18. The Lord also said, Give the following instructions to the entire community of Israel. You must be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Do not twist justice into legal matters by favoring the poor or being partial to the rich and powerful. Always judge people fairly. Do not spread slanderous gossip among your people. Do not stand idly by when your neighbor's life is threatened. I am the Lord. Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. Confront people directly so you will not be held guilty for their sin. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against another, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Please stand for the hearing of the gospel. It's from John chapter 13, verses 31 through 38. As soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, The time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory, and God will be glorified because of him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he will give his own glory to the Son, and he will do so at once. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I am going. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. But why can't I come now, Lord, he asked. I'm ready to die for you. Jesus answered, die for me? I tell you the truth, Peter, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. This is God's word for the God's people today. Thanks be to God. We are in the midst of a phenomenon that you may not be really aware of. It's a relatively new one. It's called the vanishing neighbor effect. Kind of rings true, doesn't it? The vanishing neighbor effect. It actually was coined out of a book by Mark Dundelman, and he, he wrote a book by that title, Vanishing Neighbor. And in that, he offers some statistics But first, I want to ask you a few questions. You don't have to show sign of hands or anything, but just think about this. Have you ever met your neighbors? Do you know their names? Do you engage with them on any kind of regular basis, whether once a week, once a year? Do you know about them? about their family, or anything else about them. And if you have met them, or even if you have not, do you like them or find them horribly annoying and troublesome? Well, Mark did some work and recorded in his book out of research that he did that one-third of Americans have no idea who their neighbor is. I'm sorry, only one-third of the Americans have any idea who their neighbor is. And out of that one-third, only 20% know anything about their neighbor. Well, that's a statistic I'm not very proud to be a part of. Because I have to say there are neighbors that I'm not acquainted with. And I'm sure you can kind of fit in there too. And it's not just a matter of, oh, well, you know, they're getting along just fine. They don't need me to know who they are, but folks, it may be a matter of life and death. Sad story came, was reported in the Boston Globe. Her name was um, Adele Gab, Gab, Gabbery, I'm sorry, Adele Gabbery, and Adele Uh, lived in a neighborhood that was known to be not very friendly. 
that came out later on in the article when they were researching. But the neighbors were definitely responsible people because as Adele's grass in her front yard became hip deep, they had a local boy mow it down regularly. When her pipes burst from being frozen, they notified the water company and had her water turned off. When her mail began to spill out of the mail slot in her door and onto her front porch, they contacted the police. One thing that they did not do was to check in on Adele. When the police finally investigated and broke in the side door of the house, they found the skeletal remains of a woman that appeared to be the 73-year-old Adele. What made the matter even more horrifying, she had been dead for four years. When her neighbor was interviewed, her neighbor said, oh, we used to be best friends. But then I had to go back to work. And every time when I came home from work, she would come over to visit. And it just got so annoying that I stopped answering the door. And so Adele was forgotten. That's a horrific case, but it does matter. It matters that we care, that we show others that we love, and not just because it's something that's important to them or it's important to us, but it's important to Jesus Christ. He tells us, we hear throughout Scripture, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to love others. We hear in this gospel, Jesus says, just as I have loved you, you should love others. You should love each other. And he said, this is a new commandment. Well, the context for this is very interesting, and I tried to include enough in our scripture reading from John 13 so you could get the gist of where this set in scripture. Judas had just left to betray Jesus. And just after Jesus gives this new command, it is Peter who says, oh, I would die for you, Jesus. And Jesus knowingly says, you're going to deny me. You're going to betray me. My faithful, loving Peter, you will fail. This is what was surrounding this context of Jesus giving this new commandment. Just as I have loved you, love each other. Well, this really isn't such a new teaching in Scripture. We have this in Leviticus 19, love your neighbor as yourself. And this commandment that Jesus is talking about, I mean, we're all familiar with the Ten Commandments, right? We find them in Scripture in Exodus 20, verses 2 through 17. We also can find them in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 6 through 21. But folks, in between ex the Leviticus book in the Old Testament and the Deuteronomy book in the Old Testament is Leviticus. And Leviticus was written, and it was given to us by Moses as a personal application for 
the Ten Commandments. This is what it looks like, folks, when you're living out the Ten Commandments. And one of those we hear in Leviticus 19, to love your neighbor as yourself. That's how you apply it. That's how you live it out. So when Jesus said, I'm giving you a new command, we're thinking, well, really not, Jesus. This was part of the Old Testament. Moses talked about this. Jesus' new command was, just as I have loved you. That's how you're to love. So what does that look like? Well, we hear in John 13, we hear some examples of what that is going to look like. We hear in verses 31 and 32 that it is a costly love. It's a love based in self-sacrifice, giving up of ourselves for another. You see, when we love out of self-sacrifice, of giving up something of ourselves for someone else, God's love and mercy and justice and righteousness shine through. It points to God. That's a costly love. And then in verse 33 of this John 13 chapter, we hear that it is also a caring love. This verse starts with dear children, and Jesus is calling these dear, calling us dear children. Words of endearment, words of love. Now, if you read on, it says, I'm about ready to leave you, folks. That doesn't sound very loving, right? If you really loved me, you'd stay. But what Jesus says just in the next chapter of John, John 14, he says, I am going to prepare a place for you. In other words, Jesus' work on our behalf had just begun and continues on day in and day out. It is a love that continues and cares it does not end. We also, in this caring kind of love, we might be sitting back and thinking, you know, it's all great to command everybody to love and, and to be good to one another, but I'm just not feeling it. I mean, I don't feel like I love all those people who are so different than me, who live differently, who speak differently, who dress differently, who act differently, who believe in a different political party than I do. I'm just not feeling it, Pastor. Well, let me give you an example. The example is a train. And I want you to think of it this way. The engine of the train is God's word. And what allows the train to move is the coal, and that's your faith. You see, when we have faith and apply God's work, take steps of faith and live into God's word, we move into action and the engine moves. Feelings are the caboose. Eventually, you begin to feel it. But you may have a long train and it may take a long time of acting out of love for others before you begin to feel it. But it comes. Our feelings are not what should fuel our acts of loving one another. 
Then also, Jesus' love is conspicuous. Now, that may seem kind of a duh. You know, you're going to love somebody and, and you want them to know it. It's not just in here, right? It has to show up somewhere. But I want you to notice, have you ever thought about those 12 that Jesus called? Really taking a look at those? I want to just highlight two. One is Simon the Zealot. A zealot is someone who opposed the Roman rule. They were a violent group. They were so violent in opposing Roman government that they actually murdered, plotted, and murdered some of the Roman officials. The zealots did not pay taxes, and they hated tax collectors who were considered to be traitors of the Jewish people because they were Jews employed by the Romans to collect taxes. Then Jesus calls Matthew a tax collector who in the mind of a Jew had sold his Jewish soul to the Romans for money in order to become wealthy. A person that was despised. In Jesus' day, you could not have gotten two Jewish people that far apart on any scale. These were two of the people that Jesus was saying, you must love like I love. You should love each other. That's who Jesus is talking to. We are who Jesus is talking to. We don't necessarily have to feel it. We don't necessarily have to like them. In fact, the question usually raised is, well, do I have to like the people I love? Well, <laughs> according to Jesus' example, not necessarily. He loved everybody. His self-sacrificial love was for everyone. But folks, he had some he liked more than others. He called 12 to be with him all the time. And out of those 12, he had three that he singled out multiple times in the Gospels. And that was Peter, James, and John. And John, well, this is according to the book of John. <laughs> but John is singled out in John 13, verse 1, as the disciple Jesus loved best. So I think Jesus did have some favorite people, but his love was for all all people. There was a man named Greg. He was a quadriplegic, had been his entire life. His family had never done anything for him or with him or on his behalf. He was isolated, and when his neighbor John discovered that Greg even existed, he asked the family, he first asked Greg, but he asked the family if he could accompany Greg to a camp for the physically handicapped, disabled folks. A week-long camp. Well, the family was thrilled to have Greg out of the house for a week. So that was no question. And so John went with Greg to this camp. And he did everything for Greg, even though they just pretty much just met. 
He fed him everything that Greg ate. He changed him. He cleaned him. He took care of all his, his personal needs. And this was just the regular stuff that had to happen. Then he also took him out into camp. And they explored in the woods, and they met lots of people at camp. And they made friends, and Greg went to his first campfire at night, and he sat around the campfire, and he listened to people singing. And then he went swimming. He never even thought about swimming before, knew nothing about it, had never experienced the water like that. It was a thrill of a lifetime. At the end of camp, each camper had a host or had a paid camp instructor that was with them. And so they would pair up and they would present what that camper had done that week. Well, Greg had a lot of difficulty speaking, and so John shared what Greg had gotten to experience that week. And the question at the end was always, what was your favorite thing that you experienced at camp? Most of them would say things like swimming or the campfire. They had animals at camp, and they got to meet the animals. And so John was a little worried about whether the other campers would be able to understand him when he, it was his turn to answer that question. And the question came, and they said, Greg, what was your favorite part of camp this year? And Greg raised an arm and pointed to John and said, you. One week made a big difference. Jesus' command to love the way he loves is one of those Mount Everest kind of commands. Most of us never really get to Mount Everest. And if we happen to be able to climb up and succeed, we don't live up there. We come back down to the real world. That's much like how many of us, most of us, and I might even just say all of us, experience this command of Jesus Christ. This self-sacrificing, it's costly, caring, conspicuous love. We have a lot of work to do in this area, folks. But it's a matter of life and death. It makes a difference in our lives and in the lives of all of those around us. The world around us desperately needs for us to get this right. Jesus said, just as I love you, you should love others. Amen.
let us stand for the benediction. <clears throat> Jesus loves each of you individually, independently, with a love that is self-sacrificing, that cares about you unendingly and shows up in many, many ways in your life. Go and love others likewise. Amen. <laughs>